This is our top-of-the-line semi-solid body guitar. It was really designed as a, a statement of what we could do with our guitar artistry. Mike's laying mother of pearl all around the outside of this guitar in a channel that he's left in the Ivoroid. This guitar will have over 250 pieces of mother of pearl. Each piece is done by hand, but one of the things that's really different about the way we do it is the size of the pieces. You can see that the pieces are pre-cut from a larger piece of mother of pearl. The way to tell a really quality job is to look at the size of the pieces. It's very easy to lay a number of small pieces around a curve, but what he's done is he's actually cut a large piece to shape around the horn of the guitar. The only way to get a fit like this is to cut it by hand, because every guitar is going to be slightly different. He's laying glue into the slot that he's created, and he can just drop that piece of mother of pearl in. He's got to make sure that he keeps it flush with the top. On this particular model, the pearl goes all the way around the body and up and down the neck and around the peg head. It takes about 20 hours to do all of the inlay around the periphery of the guitar, the neck, and the peg head. Most guitar builders wouldn't have the patience to do this. An educated buyer is going to know that the larger pieces are really where the artistry is. I love the way the grain on the rosewood plays against the inlay. Each individual piece of inlay is put into the neck by hand. We carry the same motif with the, the shell inlay all the way down the fingerboard and onto the peghead where our logo is in Mother of Pearl. Those are all the guitars waiting to be worked on. They haven't had the slot cut for the peghead binding yet. What Dave's doing here goes back hundreds of years. This is Italian Ivoroid. It's a cellulose material. Rather than using a, an injection molded piece or an extruded plastic, we buy the sheets of the material from Italy and cut it into strips. Using an 800 degree heat gun, the material is softened so that it can be placed directly onto the contour of the guitar for a clean and precise fit. The way luthiers did it hundreds of years ago, cutting each individual piece by hand and then hand fitting them together it's a craft that's been lost in modern guitar making. After we let the neck settle for over two weeks, then we machine the perfect playing surface onto the rosewood fingerboard. Here you can see that one side of the fingerboard is slightly thicker than the other. We've actually compensated for the natural twist that happens in any neck that you would build. If we didn't wait until the very last moment before we fretted it to put that playing surface on, that same twist would now be in your fretted surface and you'd have to get a fret job. Because we have a perfect playing surface, we just press the frets down until they're snug on the board. We've looked at a lot of different ways to insert the frets, including a, something that's done automatically. But when you come to the end of the day, nothing beats the human hand. Now a machine can't tell if the grain is open, so it'll bury the fret. And if the grain is tight, it won't go down all the way, and you'll get a guitar that needs to have the frets honed. Now, I know a lot of builders boast about how great their fret jobs are, or how well they hone the frets smooth. But if you get the fingerboard exactly right, and then fret it correctly, you don't need to touch the frets with anything. Just a quick brush, just to clean them up, and away you go. One of our trademarks is the way we bring the edge of the binding over the end of the fret. It's just a, a little touch that we do, and the only way to really get it exactly right is to do it by hand. And what he's got to do here is just use a file, a small knife, just to notch the binding out and then contour it right around the end of the fret. When the fingerboard will swell or shrink with the change of the season, it uh, keeps the end of the fret from poking out of the side of the fingerboard. He's finding the Ivoroid binding down flush with the fingerboard. And you don't want to leave a lip because the guitarist will feel that. You don't want to drop it down below because it'll look untidy. This is all about the feel of the guitar. Although the binding is decorative and the way that it goes over the ends of the frets really is a pretty thing to look at, it's also to protect the player from the edge of the frets. And it's also, uh, you know, we have to make sure that it's very smooth when you move your hand up and down the neck and you don't feel any irregularities. So he's really got to get this exactly right.
1980, we started going to a, uh, what we call a stressed neck system. It's a system of aligning counterbalanced pieces of wood. We'll have a neutral piece that runs through the center of the neck, and the two side pieces are mirror images of each other with opposing grain. So any tendency of one piece of wood to want to twist in one direction is counterbalanced or counteracted by the other one that wants to twist in the opposite direction. Since we've employed this technique, there have been virtually no returns of our guitars for twisted necks. You can look at one of our guitars hanging on a rack and actually see how straight the grain in the neck is. But one thing that most people aren't even aware of, even some of the best techs don't realize that the straightness of the grain of the fingerboard can also affect the way the neck bends from side to side. And the way to avoid having any problem in this area is to pre-select the fingerboard wood for the straightness of grain because it it affects the way the guitar will move with humidity changes. The straightest grain is what's going to give you the most stable neck. We reject maybe 60% of the wood that comes in because it's not good enough. Once again, we're, we're building an instrument that has an individual character so that you could recognize that guitar from across the room and know that it's your guitar and your guitar alone. Dave, is, uh, he's using a cabinet scraper which is basically a piece of steel that has a, a burnished edge on it. He's using that to, uh, to scrape the neck down to the final shape. It's been pre-curved and uh, allowed to normalize for several weeks. This allows the wood to do its natural twisting and at the very last moment we'll radius the fingerboard for the playing surface and carve the last little bit of the neck and that essentially takes any twist that might have happened, it takes it right out, so it doesn't go in the final guitar. We have two contours that we, that we work to, one which is called a vintage contour and one that's called a modern contour. You pick a guitar up in a store and play it for a few minutes, a thin neck feels like it's fast or very comfortable, but if you have to play it for an hour set, like a professional would, Actually, uh, it starts to cramp your, your hand. So what we're looking here is a very rounded and uh, actually kind of beefy neck. It really gives uh, the guitar a lot of sustain, gives the guitar a lot of tone, and it's a lot more comfortable in, to play in the long run. One of the differences between a mass-produced guitar and one that's genuinely handcrafted is the quality of the neck joint. We under-machine the size of the neck socket on every guitar we build so that we can hand fit the neck to the body. This is the crossroads. This is the place where the neck and the body's vibrations meet. And you want a good transfer of energy between the two to make a guitar that really sustains well. You can see how tightly the neck fits into the body here. By opening up the socket with chisels and a diamond file, Bill's able to make a neck joint that fits firmly and transfers the energy efficiently. By using a dovetail neck joint that's about 40% larger than a tenon type that's used in mass-produced guitars, we get more energy transfer from the body to the neck. The guitar has more sustain this way, and it sings with a more vibrant voice. The thing that we've really stressed year in and year out since the very beginning is that every guitar be identifiable. It's an individual instrument for an individual person. No two guitars are going to be exactly the same. The finishing process takes in excess of eight days, building up the color and the clear coats layer after layer. Staining wood is probably the oldest technique used on this type of wood, but we've moved it to a new level by actually floating the sunburst off the wood. Because we, we lay the color over a series of clear coats, it gives the guitar a prismatic effect. It really sets the guitar apart. After the first three coats of clear, we use a base coat of the yellow that will appear in the middle of the guitar. Now what he's doing is he's actually reading the flame of the guitar because every guitar has its own unique character and he'll bring the burst in or out to accentuate that particular piece of wood. And even though that makes each guitar a little different from the next, that's exactly what we're going for. It takes a lot more time to build up the paint layer by layer, but it's worth it. One of the things that's most important to us here is preserving the individual character of every single piece of wood that we work with. 
something you, you can't do in mass production and, and something that's really a lost art today. After the color is applied to the face of the guitar, we have to go around the entire periphery with a, with a scraper knife, remove the color from the binding. This is the best way to make a really sharp edge. It's much better than masking it with tape, but it takes a steady hand. This is a place where hand work really pays off because you get that precision line that you can only get with a knife. You can imagine how long it takes to learn this job. Once he's finished with this stage, the guitar can go back into the spray booth and get its clear coats.